You are listening to Make Change Happen, the podcast from the International Institute for Environment and Development. With the UN taking gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow as its theme for this year's International Women's Day, in this episode, our guests discuss whether a climate justice framing to mitigation and adaptation responses can provide a suitable vehicle for onboarding concerns around gender equality and intersectionality. Hello, and welcome once again to Make Change Happen. I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. And I just wanted to say our number of listens suggests that people are enjoying these regular discussions that we're having. So I'm hoping today will be no exception. So today's conversation is in response to International Women's Day. And the UN theme for the day was gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. This is a theme close to our hearts in IID, and over the last month, we've been exploring a number of ideas, and I hope you've managed to see those on www.iied.org. Please do check out our blogs and other related information. But back to today. With me are three guests, and I will ask them to introduce themselves in just a moment. And we're going to talk about gender, intersectionality, and climate justice. And it's that climate justice focus that we're really going to explore. So um, I hope, like me, uh, you'll enjoy the discussion. So without further ado, can I ask my guests to introduce themselves? And Heather, perhaps we could start with you. Thank you, Liz. My name is Heather McRae, and I'm the director of the Climate Justice Resilience Fund, or CJRF. We are a grant-making initiative that pools funding from several different philanthropies and makes grants to support women and young people and Indigenous people in um, building and scaling solutions for resilience. Great, thank you. Vitu. Thank you, Liz and colleagues, uh, for having me. My name is Vitumbiko Chinoko. I'm the project manager of the Open Forum on Agriculture Biotechnology, uh, AATF, based in Nairobi. My other engagements are on climate change diplomacy at international level, but also at Africa processes. So I'm really glad to be here. And welcome. Really nice to have you with us. Tracy. Uh, thank you, Liz. My name is Tracy Tajunda. I'm a principal researcher in the climate change group at IID. I'm also the institutional lead for intersectional disadvantage and inequality. Good to be here. Great to have you with us, Tracy. So I think let's start at the beginning, thinking about our listeners. Uh, what do we mean by climate justice? Which one of you would like to take the plunge and talk about that for us? I can get us started, Liz. Here at the Climate Justice Resilience Fund, we really have three dimensions of climate justice that we think about. The first is to recognize that climate justice means climate action approaches that center people that center people's rights, their lived experience, and their own priorities. And this is in contrast to a lot of climate action that has centered science or counting greenhouse gas emissions or polar bears. <laughs> the second dimension um, building on that is really that we lift up marginalized groups. So this includes women, it includes young people, it includes ethnic minorities and poor people people who historically have faced a lot of injustices and their experience of climate change um, is mediated by those injustices. This is, I think, something we'll get into later as we talk about intersectionality. Then the third thing that we really focus on for climate justice is that we aim for systemic change. Recognizing historical injustice isn't just about mm, technical interventions or, or helping individuals in particular ways. There's bigger picture systems at work, and we need bigger picture change in order to really make progress on climate change. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, so I think there's there's some big issues, aren't there? But, you know, let's let's explore. So, Tracy, I think something around intersectionality would be good to explain. You know, I think for people just really understanding that and its relation to climate justice would be helpful. Indeed, it's important because climate change affects different groups differently. And the concept of climate justice emerged to frame global warming as an ethical and political issue. 
it is ethical because the causes and effects of climate change relate to historical injustices and it's political because it has to do with rights, governance and decision making. And we all know that rights are claimed and contested, so it's indeed political. So in terms of intersectionality then, uh, it requires addressing the dynamics of oppression, privilege and the isms, recognizing that society is the product of historically rooted systems of oppression, socially constructed on race, class, gender, intergenerational justice and others. And uh, the critical issue of the youth, we've seen youth on the street demonstrating uh, Fridays for the future. So intersectional justice is a big issue in terms of past and contemporary lifestyles, consumption patterns, and the causes of the high emissions which are going to affect the young generation and they'll have to bear the cost. So climate justice therefore requires safeguarding the rights of the most vulnerable and sharing the burdens and benefits of climate change fairly and equitably. Thank you, Tracy. As I think we can see the complexity of the different layers involved. V2, what does was climate justice mean for you and, and the communities or people you work with? Yeah, so I think from the background of where I'm coming from, being the global south, I would look at climate justice to pick on the second point that uh, Tracy and he and he that talked about our focus on the marginalized communities. Look at this: uh, if if the same climate-induced uh, disaster hits the United States of America. United States of America would be able to come back uh, on its knees within very few days. If the same amount of of disaster hits uh, my small town in Malawi, uh, Malawi would have to call for international support to be able to to come back on its knees. And what does that mean? It really means that climate justice has an economic angle uh, in the sense that those communities, those uh, countries that have uh, economic muscle are able to respond better and faster uh, because because they have an economic background. And the reason why I'm bringing this one up is that most of the developed economies that we see today that have a muscle, economic or otherwise, to be able to respond quickly on the issues of climate change when they're affected, it's because they have developed this capacity on the grounds of or on the account of the emissions that we're talking about. Uh, so most of the economies of the uh, global north have actually been developed on account of the emissions, the same emissions that are causing uh, problems in the global south. So the manner in which the global south is actually affected disproportionately compared to the global north in terms of the impacts, in terms of the ability or inability to respond to the impacts of climate change, for me as somebody coming from the global south who has actually lived and experienced the impacts of climate change, basically embodies uh, what climate justice is all about. So it's really about putting out the problem there and saying who has caused the problem and how can we address the problem that has been caused. And in this case, we're looking at responsibility, we're looking at uh, accountability, but we're also looking at, uh, even in terms of the future, we're not just looking at today. So indeed connecting how to ensure that these communities are able to assure that they are people that this country that you are in is actually going to be there tomorrow. And thank you, Vito. I think we can see there so clearly that this injustice runs deep. Thank you for that. So, Tracy, I know that you see this as highly relevant to the issue, sort of equality, you know, this question of climate finance and women's economic empowerment. So it, it's not just the national challenges that people have around the access to money. It's actually in terms of gender equality, a key issue. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, there's a lot of work on climate finance, a lot of discussion at the recent COP, finance for loss and damage and others were really big issues. And we know that uh, money and power go hand in hand. So this is not different for climate finance. It is power between the developed and developing countries, governments and citizens, civil society, and with groups that are marginalized, including women. So the gender responsiveness of climate finance in terms of policies and implementation is important. But there is a mismatch. So there has been efforts to develop gender policies by climate funds, but implementation most of the time is not aligned with what those policies stipulate. Evaluations done on global funds have found that projects mention gender to access funding because it's a requirement in the proposals. But when the activities are assessed then, the inclusion of 
meaningful and transformative gender approaches in the projects are really lacking. And uh, at country level, there's really limited projects and limited engagement, including gender equality and inclusion into the project. IID conducted a study on adaptation funds going to the LDCs. It was found that less than 3% of verified LDC primary adaptation finance intends to support gender equality, despite the disproportionate impacts of climate change on women and girls. And then the other challenge I see is the parallel efforts at international and national level. We, we've been doing some work on the inclusive budgeting for climate change adaptation in Africa, focusing on a number of African countries. But some of the lessons we've learned is that public finance management systems need to integrate gender and climate. But then there's a challenge whereby you have finance people who are doing this work. They don't have all the skills required because you're doing double mainstreaming of gender and climate. So how do you then bring it together? It requires coordination. It requires a, a whole of government approach to be able to address these issues together and make sure that the budgeting, the planning, the implementation is looking at how gender equality can be integrated into national efforts. And then at global level, there are different ways of tracking. For example, OECD tracks using the real markers for climate, gender markers for gender. And these two are not even speaking together. So it becomes really difficult to bring the two together. And that's where the challenges are. But we also learned through IID climate finance work that decentralized climate finance a decentralizing of climate funds work that has been done in a number of African countries, that if you make gender and inclusion part of the program and make sure that different groups are engaging, are participating, are making decisions on investments, there are benefits that come with that. Uh, we learned when we did the gender analysis that women were attesting to being able to access public investments that are relevant for their climate challenges, including water sources being near them, investing in small economic activities, but most of all, even gaining decision-making power on local platforms, which they didn't have earlier. So they are good examples that if you do this intentionally, it will work, it will make a difference, it will be transformative. So thank you, Tracy. Um, I think V2, you, you'll have something to say about this. What about all these issues around climate finance for adaptation and mitigation? How do, how do they apply, you know, in a practical sense to what are urgent issues for men and women experiencing the effects of climate loss and damage on the ground? What's the real effect here for, let's say, a woman in the community you work with? Yeah, so one of the things that we are experiencing on everyday basis is the fact that the resources to adaptation is actually dwindling. And that has an effect on the woman on the ground because women are the ones that depend most on natural resources based uh, livelihoods. Uh, so they're always working on the fields. They are the ones depending on, on how uh, the climate is so that they can go and, and farm and provide for their families, take care of the babies. So the extent to which we are actually at international level providing for climate finance actually affects our women. And one of the uh, biggest climate funds is the Green Climate Fund. And the, uh, five years ago, they came up with a decision to divide 50-50 between adaptation and mitigation. And the, it, that has not been ineffective because at that time, at the time of the resolution, they were saying that they're going to make uh, initiatives or, or efforts to ensure that we strive for 50-50. What that means is that currently most resources are going into mitigation. I will not saying that mitigation is not important, uh, but it is actually surprising with all the abundant evidence of how people are affected on the ground. We have the whole Green Climate Fund that cannot quickly just move in and make it 50-50. It just shows where the imbalance or the injustice actually is. Uh, in terms of our investment or climate investment in women because this is the 50% that was going to go into uh, lives of women. I would want to mention that I think beyond climate just affecting food insecurity of uh, most women and their households, we've also seen that women are actually forced to make very life-threatening decisions when uh, things are very difficult for them on the ground, when they cannot feed their children, when they cannot take care of themselves. We've actually seen, for example, with 
the El Nino in, in Mozambique, where most women ended up are illegal and irregular uh, sex work, uh, infecting themselves with HIV and also uh, their families and all that because their husband had to go to town to fend for, for their families, but they never came back. And so we see really that this climate finance, there's, there's a way in which we, are, we should be able to structure it at global level, uh, be it at UNFCCC or even at African Union when we're developing funds and also strategies in a manner that is able to respond uh, to the specific needs of women who are disproportionately uh, affected by climate change. Thanks, V2. Is there any example of where this has been done? I think we've seen one of them, for example, in response to loss and damage. We've seen different uh, governments uh, signing into the sovereign insurance, a, a great initiative. Uh, but the manner in which, for example, some of the aspects of this insurance are actually implemented on the ground leaves a lot to be desired in as far as integrating women into uh, these funds is concerned. And I think uh, the issue of insurance in response to, to loss and damage is one of the things that we need to be looking at. I think most women uh, cannot just respond to uh, the normal insurance. I think they'll need social protection. And even that needs to be structured in a very gender sensitive manner. Thank you, Vita. I, I suppose what we're seeing is that, you know, mechanisms or channels or flows of investment that speak to success in certain situations are very much not doing that for women and that, that they do get left out. You know, I liked your point about, you know, social protection for the ultra poor, just, you know, they don't get the access that they need. So I think maybe that takes us to Heather. I know that you You've got lots of experience and perspective on the kind of the capabilities of institutions and how how they can or can't perhaps integrate gender in their work. Yeah, the, um, the you know, the kind of example that, that V2 just raised is, is something we see really often where institutions, whether it's at the national level or an international funder like CGRF, they're they're not sufficiently capacitated to tailor solution sets to the specifics of the on the ground context and the specific of women's experience. I can give you an example from my own fund. Um, when we were just getting up and running as a fund, uh, we had an application from a wonderful organization in Bangladesh called Coast Trust. And they put forward this really multifaceted in proposal to us that had various components to it. Some of them were really technical around climate smart agriculture and adapting water and sanitation. And others were advocacy oriented around building a coalition. But there were some pieces there that I didn't, I couldn't make sense of. There was work around education for boys who were outside of the public education system. And there was a club, a radio club for teenage girls, um, which, I, you know, I was like, well, this is a, a climate fund where I, I understand the economic empowerment pieces. I understand the adaptation pieces. Why do we have these education and girls clubs components? Um, and their, their executive director worked really hard with me to, to understand this proposal. He said, you know, Heather, the teenage girls are the most vulnerable people in our context. And these radio clubs, it's not just about radio. It's about girls having a place to build their capabilities. Uh, you know, in this case, the girls, they're listening to the radio and talking about it. Um, they're also working at a community radio station and developing programming um, and becoming a, a resource for their community in new ways and sharing their perspective as girls, getting to learn about their community, getting to engage in ways that are really important and protective. Because under a changing climate, you know, the specifics of a, a young woman's experience can be really extreme. All of these components of this, this coast proposal that I shared with you, I learned eventually were centering these girls and protecting them from the circumstances where um, if there's a climate emergency, their families are much more likely to feel a need to have their daughters get married. And child marriage 
Um, there's all kinds of evidence out there of how damaging it is, not only for the girls, but for their families and the long-term development of their communities. And, um, and this was an example of how the institution I worked for was, was not really able to see the nuances of this and, and respond to it until there had been quite a lot of exchange and listening um, to this applicant and honestly, quite a, a bit of advocacy from, from their side towards us to make sure that we understood what was really happening on the ground for the girls that they worked with. Isn't that so interesting? Because what it shows you is just what we were talking about around intersectionality, the complexity and the nuance of people who experience, you know, a lack of power or discrimination at different places in their life, be it education, be it financial empowerment, be it gender. So that's a really nice example. Thank you for that. I mean, V2, does that resonate with you, that example? Do you have similar experiences? Yeah, so there's uh, a lot of other examples similar to what my colleague has just uh, narrated. But I, I also want to bring on board issues around how this uh, climate crisis, for example, uh, disproportionately impacts uh, girls and women more than boys and men. So when you look at, for example, the issue of uh, school dropouts, uh, in, in cases of climate emergencies, uh, sometimes culturally, however we might want to look at it bad or whatever, you find that uh, girls tend to drop out of school because either the road has been cut off because of the uh, flooding, and therefore we can actually see that the uh, climate is also contributing to low education attainment of girls. Um, the other issue that I also want to bring on board is the fact that I think sometimes when you have a system uh, that is not addressing the needs of uh, the greatest part of your population, I think we need to just look at that challenge in the eye and call it injustice. And and my core is that I think one, we need to recognize the advantage point that men have and really make it a point that uh, we need to uh, reach out, uh, make sure, and we're very deliberate, uh, to reach out to women and bring them into the decision-making processes. I would also want to mention that maybe some of the sustainability issues around climate change, uh, beat adaptation or mitigation, maybe it is indeed coming in because we've left out the biggest part of our population. We've not listened to them. We've not been able to uh, know exactly what are their needs so that when we're designing adaptation, how exactly should we design this adaptation uh, project so that we address uh, the needs of these women, uh, the needs of these uh, girls? Uh, because sometimes we've gone out there uh, to do a big climate adaptation work and then we've actually uh, noted that it doesn't give us an impact and i'm actually thinking that maybe it's time to reflect on some of the initiatives that very small organizations with very little money have done but because they've taken time to listen to what people are actually looking for uh, they've actually made an impact so i'm looking at the example from care who is actually my former employer through their village savings and loans uh, who have made tremendous impact in terms of improving food security, improving the whole community resilience through very little uh, investment around village savings and loans, and leaves me with the question, what if these kind of initiatives were taken up by government? Now, what if these initiatives were actually are supported by big funds like uh, the Green Climate Fund? These would actually give a lot of positive outcomes than maybe some of the most sophisticated funds that have been uh, deployed out there. So it really takes about listening to the people that are most affected, and in this case, women and girls, and designing projects that would address their needs and lift them uh, to uh, where they need to be. Thank you for that, video. I think you're leading us into what I understand this kind of talk around now, which is sort of this just transition. How, how do we get these these approaches that could really change all the previous injustices? And we, we know that's a difficult thing to strive for, but you've outlined a few key things there. I mean, Heather, what, what's your principal just transition that you would like to see? Or what are the things that you're all thinking about in terms of this just transition to a better way of doing things? Well, you know, this concept of just transition is really interesting. And I, I think it's evolving quite rapidly right now. Um, the concept of a just transition came from the global north and really 
initially referred specifically to the working class jobs in the fossil fuel industry and other extractive industries that are going to go away and not be available as jobs as we transition to low carbon forms of energy. As the the concept of just transition has moved into the global south and as we've seen it expand and evolve, we're starting to talk about a lot of other transitions as well, not just this transition of employment from uh, extractive industries to more renewable um, energy sources. It's also come to look at issues of climate resilient agriculture and how the agricultural sector needs to evolve. And that, of course, affects many people's livelihoods, including women, including young people, um, so much of the world where smallholder agriculture is a core livelihood. Uh, There's some big changes happening there and that need to happen as we confront climate change. Also, we're seeing some real nuance as we think about the energy transition and how it affects different people. For one, access to energy is such an issue uh, in the global south, in many parts of the world. And this lack of access in many places is a huge part of doing justice as we transition energy sources from um, high carbon to low carbon. We also are seeing the need to look at the downside of that energy transition, not only in terms of jobs, but in terms of the impact on communities and on land. There's cases, many of them, unfortunately, where wind energy or solar energy at a large scale is um, really quite damaging to the land, to the community's rights and land rights. And there's similar issues around free prior and informed consent, for example, as there are with extractive industries. Um, and it's really important as we make this transition that we, we don't repeat the errors of the very damaging industries that polluted and stole, in many cases, the lands of communities in, in the global south. And bringing this intersectional lens to those transitions, I think, is, is really important so that we can have a, a holistic approach and not a, you know, a project by project, sector by sector uh, shift in how we get our energy and how we get our food, in how our societies are structured as we move from this very extractive colonial phase of history into something new. Thank you, Heather. And I think, Tracy, you know, as you are our intersectional lead, and I know you'll have a view, what resonates here for you or what would you like to add? I completely agree with Heather, and she raises very important points on differences between what just transition means for the global north and the global south. So just transition aims to achieve a fair and sustainable shift to a low carbon economy. And we all know that LDC's emissions are very minimal, though they suffer the greatest impacts. So the question is, and the question that people are asking in the global south is, what are we transiting from? I think that's a question that we need to answer. Each country needs to develop its own definition to respond to the needs of their citizens and economies. If we take it from the global scale, wholesome just transition, I think there's a problem. And uh, from a gender perspective, my concern is that we're already dealing with increasing inequality for women and other disadvantaged groups. But when you look at women, they are largely in the informal sectors. They are engaged in care roles that are not recognized or valued. And that ILO estimates that globally women earn 77% of what men earn. And at the current trends, it will take 70 years to close the gender wage gap. And uh, th- there are other challenges, of course, that come with climate impacts, uh, issues of uh, seasonal and post-migration, the feminization of agricultural labor, which is largely goes to the women and children. IID recently published a report on modern slavery pushed by climate impacts and migration. So all those challenges compound to really raise questions of how do we make just transition gender responsive and also looking at other categories within the framework. And uh, uh, this builds on already problematic issues of equality, especially for women. When you look at women entrepreneurs, they are disproportionately represented in businesses and enterprises. They have less access to credit and loans, and they're all, most of them actually are in the small informal sector. So be honest, without 
gender inclusion, there can't be any just transition because it will still continue with the cycle of exclusion and disadvantage based on the challenges that women and other groups face. So we've come to that time in the programme. Believe it or not, uh, our time is nearly up. And I always ask my guests to give me something about change, the change they want to see. This is our Make Change Happen podcast. And we like to finish with what's the one thing you'd like to see happen to achieve climate justice for all people or even a just transition? You can choose. Heather, can I start with you? Sure. Thank you, Liz. This is hard to pick, of course, how to how to choose just one change that we need in such a nuanced and, and integrated set of challenges. But I think I would, as a funder, like to focus on what funders can and should do differently. And there is a real need to shift away from highly siloed modes of delivering funding toward much more holistic and systems oriented changes. And one straightforward way to do this is really to have new voices driving funding based on lived experience. Women and girls on the ground, they, they don't think in terms of um, you know, the agriculture challenge and the water challenge and the you know, income challenge. These things are all part of their day-to-day -day lives and bringing them together and bringing the voices of people who experience all these silos as one thing, I think can really be transformative for funding. Of course, this is a big shift, shifting who decides and how decisions get made about funding, bringing women's voices to the fore and making certain they have the power to decide where money goes and how it gets deployed uh, so that we can get past some of these harmful silos that, that really don't do justice to lived experience and real needs. Um, this is a big shift in power and something we're exploring at the Climate Justice Resilience Fund um, and are hoping to, to help move forward, not only for ourselves, but for other funders. Thank you, Heather. This sounds like really exciting work. Um, and I know that, you know, any shift in power in the right direction is very much at the heart of our thinking. Tracy, what, what would be your one big change. If I may be allowed to dream really to say the kind of change that I would want to see is addressing inequality and uh, decolonizing approaches to development. And it's not just about women or individual groups. It's a global challenge of how power is shared, how partnerships between the global north and global south are maintained. And if there's willingness to really and genuinely share power and resources and letting the local people lead, that would be the kind of change I would want to see, where we recognize that we are process facilitators and let the local people have the voice, the LDC governments, the communities, the women, and we're able to share the power and invest in things that really matter for different regions, different economies, different people than taking finished agendas for people to walk around, uh, to, to follow. So for me, that's the change that I would want to see. Thank you very much. And finally, V2, last but by definitely no means least, what change would you like to see or do you think should happen that would sort of unlock the biggest challenges here? Yeah, so what I've noted really is that uh, we've seen this pronouncement on commitments to gender or to climate justice at the highest level, but even at lower levels like national governments. The only challenge I've noted is that um, by and large, these pronouncements are not backed up by resources. So whatever is agreed at international level, whether you say at UNFCCC that you're going to do gender, uh, good as it may sound, but if it's not backed by resources that are able going to drive that agenda on the ground, uh, that is not going to happen. So my call really is that I think all of us do believe that gender is important, climate justice is important, uh, but can we now add another layer to it by really backing out those uh, pronouncements uh, with financial resources uh, by technology? Uh, but also capacity to be able to implement uh, these pronouncements on the ground. Obviously, I think we also need partnerships at national level uh, because, like my colleague has said, 
uh, it's really about systemic implementation. Now, if you're looking at systemic implementation, uh, then that means one organization cannot do it. I think one organization will be able to realize their limitations, but through partnerships, uh, then they can actually cover up their limitations by bringing in other organizations that can help to engage uh, or empower that woman, uh, that girl who is affected on the ground. So partnerships and more resources to implementing climate justice on the ground, those will be my two calls. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, V2. And I think we can hear uh, amongst us a lot of consensus. So I'd like to wrap up now. Um, and I'd like to, if I may, V2, repeat some words you said earlier, which is that we all need to look at the challenge in the eye and call it injustice. I really liked your framing there. And I think through this episode today, we've really understood where some of those injustices are and what we need to do about it. So I think I'd just like to say thank you to my guests, Heather McGray. Tracy Kajumba and Vitumbiko Chinoko, and to thank you for a terrific conversation and wish you luck with the changes you'd like to see and drive forward. To my listeners, thank you very much. Please do share this with any other colleagues or friends that you think may be interested, and we look forward to talking again next time. And you can find out more about today's podcast, our guests and their work at www.iied.org slash podcast, where you can also listen to more episodes. You can leave us feedback or follow the podcast at soundcloud.com slash the IIED. The podcast is produced and recorded by our in-house communication team. For more information about IIED and our work, please visit us online at www.iied.org.